So, uh, hello and welcome uh, to another Northern Ireland Regional Meeting. This is myself and Marion's uh, first regional meeting as um, Northern Ireland's UHS uh, Regional Meet Organisers for Northern Ireland. Um, so we're carrying on the, Adele, or the work of Adele McLeod um, and hope to continue her excellent work. Hello everybody, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, thanks for tuning in this morning. Uh, we're calling here live from NIE Networks in our newly refurbished uh, Dargan Depot. Uh, so thank you all for coming uh, today to join us. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, my partner in crime here, Cahill Mallon. So Cahill has been uh, training as an occupational hygienist since 2016. He works at Almac, um, as a pharmaceutical company, and he's doing really, really well. He's completing his PLP and will soon be up for doing his certificate. So that will get him the certificate of competence in occupational hygiene, which is fantastic. So um, without further ado, I'll pass you back to Cahill. So the other half of the Malin Malloy Regional Duo probably doesn't need much of an introduction to this audience. Mario Malloy, who is a chartered occupational hygienist with over 20 years experience in occupational hygiene and now taking up the brand new role in NIE or networks or Northern Ireland Electricity Networks. Um, the theme of today's webinar, um, the UK is in a workplace health crisis. Um, recent statistics from uh, HSE GB um, say that 1.8 million are people are suffering uh, from work-related ill health. The cost to the UK economy is 13.1 billion annually in new cases of work-related ill health. Uh, and the number of people currently uh, waiting for hospital treatment reached uh, 7.8 million. And that was as, as of September 2023. Um, so we believe the answer to this is prevention um, of workplace ill health. Um, with occupational hygiene. So we are here today to highlight the important role of occupational hygienists in preventing workplace ill health and to gain an insight into what is happening in our hospitals and uh, NHS right now and then to hear the HSE strategy plans to protect people and places and ensure healthier workplaces. So what, what we've planned then for the webinar is uh, we're going to hear firstly from uh, Dr. Paul McCagney. He's a respiratory physician local here in Northern Ireland and doing lots of good work on respiratory ill health on top of many other things that he's doing, but also working uh, particularly with the HSENI and looking at occupational health provision and maybe looking at the different multifaceted approach to occupational health. Um, so we'll hear, hear first from Paul and then we'll hear from Mike Calcutt from HSE uh, in Great Britain. So he is the Deputy Director and Head of the Health and Work Branch. Um, he'll be telling us, uh, outline what HSE's approach is to um, tackling worker health. Um, so without further ado then, I think we're ready to, to, to kick off, aren't we? Uh, so uh, we'll let you introduce Paul. So Paul is a consultant respiratory physician in the Belfast Trust um, and has been for nearly 12 years. He holds a master's in occupational health from Cardiff University. Um, and he is here to talk today about his experience with occupational ill health in Northern Ireland. So. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Cahal and Marian, and thank you to BOHS for asking me to come and speak today. Um, so I'm a consultant respiratory physician with an interest in occupational lung disease. And really, uh, I have had a bit of an interest in occupational lung disease for quite a while. I also sit on the UK group of occupational respiratory disease specialists. So this allows me a bit of a networking opportunity for those people who are more ex uh, expert in this line. But it's also good for training and it's also good for using those links to try and get some answers, particularly when there's more complex questions. But really what I want to do today is we'll keep this local and regional initially just to get an idea of what is out there, both in terms of occupational health and more particularly in the respiratory services, which I'm interested in. And then following a bit of a uh, email backwards and forwards with Cal and Marion here, there's a few things that we feel that we have a look at now. COVID hasn't gone away yet, unfortunately, but uh, and part of this was just looking at how things may have changed, but also how COVID might affect those with existing respiratory disease. 
And then from an occupational hygiene point of view, obviously the things that uh, exposures that I will see, uh, the consequences of and how those could be mitigated where possible. So obviously occupational health has actually been uh, very topical uh, in the last year or so. From the spring statement from the Chancellor, there was a bit of a focus on that in terms of everyone, health is everyone's business. And the spring budget, it was look, uh, looking at how occupational health could be improved because ultimately it's about keeping people in work because we know work is good for people and healthy people are good for work. So following on from that, there is the UK government consultation, this occupational health working better. And really this was uh, allows uh, different societies, individuals to give an input into how they feel occupational health could be improved. And this is all about trying to keep people in work, as I've mentioned. But there's also more of a focus in trying to improve multidisciplinary team working. And primarily, it's trying to reduce the pressures in primary care as well, because unfortunately, uh, when there is not a good network available out there, this will default to primary care, and unfortunately, primary care is uh, faltering a little bit, so it ends up in secondary care. So we're trying to keep those people who don't need to come into hospital or, or go to the usual health areas out of those areas, but also trying to focus this more in the workplace to keep people in work as well. If we look at some of these uh, data from the HSE website, which I nicked, the thing about this is we see lots of these exposures primarily affect the lungs. So be this asbestos, silica, any of the, the dust, gases and vapours which can cause lung disease. And so unfortunately, we've got lots of respiratory ill health that can arise from lots of these exposures. But where we are in Northern Ireland at the minute, unfortunately, we have no dedicated occupational lung disease clinic. So I had looked at a survey of this a few years ago to try and get things moving along this line. And where we are at the minute, most respiratory consultants will see these people in their general clinics. And unfortunately, there is a bit of a varying interest and varying expertise. And some things that may be uh, acted upon might get ignored. And also, depending on where people work, there's varying numbers. So what we're trying to look at is how can we improve the provision, but also standardise care a little bit more. And this is part of what we're doing now at the minute in terms of a regional occupational health practitioners group. So this is a combination of uh, myself uh, and other occupational health practitioners along with the Northern Ireland Health and Safety Executive. And we're looking at how we can improve both access but also provision. And this is looking to see how we can improve things. Uh, and I suppose what we're looking at as well as trying to improve standards, is also trying to improve numbers. So part of this is was also to try and get the occupational medicine training scheme in Northern Ireland restarted, because this has fallen by the wayside over the last three or four years. So the for what we're doing at the minute. So going on to look at how things are, what things are doing. So the first thing we thought about was COVID. And obviously COVID uh, hit the headlines in early 2020. And this is my favourite graph of, or the favourite meme of the whole COVID process. And it sums up just the great uncertainty, the great unknown of what was to be expected at the start in 2020. Uh, and we've We've seen lots of patients with COVID, we've seen lots of issues, lots of hospitalizations. Unfortunately, we have seen lots of death, and primarily this was in older age groups. But we have seen people who have got existing respiratory disease uh, who have also been, tar uh, unfortunately, hit by, by COVID. And one area where we have lots of, uh, this is all my other hat is COPD. We have lots of people who have COPD. Uh, out there in the community and very often this could be relatively mild people are still in the workplace uh, and unfortunately there are a small numbers who are out there who probably have their COPD worsen not only from their smoking but where they work as well and this can then lead to breathlessness it can lead to repeated chest infections it can lead to ill health and getting people out of the workplace so as I said smoking is the main reason that most people will get COPD but there are other occupations where you've got chronic exposure to dusts, gases and vapours, anywhere where you're breathing things in within a workplace, 
that can worsen that process when you add it to smoking. But also we, we recognize, although it's very difficult to measure exactly the numbers of people who have primarily COPD from where they work in itself. So we think of how COVID affected people and uh, the different waves of COVID affected people quite differently. And if we think of the first few waves, and if we talk about the Wuhan variant, uh, so this graph is a look, um, this is uh, um, WHO data, but essentially the case numbers are in the gray and then the deaths are in the blue. And whenever we first came down with COVID, the, the, the initial COVID variant, the Wuhan variant, was very difficult and very, uh, it was more focused in the lower respiratory tract. So people who got severe disease ended up with severe pneumonia. And these were the people coming into hospital requiring non-invasive ventilation. And these are the people who are very, very sick. So we had large numbers of relatively young people who you would never normally see in hospital coming in with severe pneumonia. The difficulty then was the people with the coexisting lung disease. And those were also hit particularly hard because obviously if you've got an underlying lung disease, your reserve is going to be less and any infection is going to hit you harder. So with the first few variants, so that was the Wuhan variant. The next one, the next peak you can see there's the Alpha or the Kent variant, and that was just before Christmas in 2020. And again, you can see after every peak in the numbers underneath, you can see a peak in deaths. The next few variants came along and Delta was really the last variant where we got large numbers of patients in hospital with severe pneumonia. So when we looked at these variants, they did increase in how easily they were transmitted, but each of these initial variants had significant lower respiratory tract uh, impact. So there were lots of patients coming to hospital with pneumonia, and we were seeing a disproportionate amount of people who had underlying lung disease coming in and unfortunately passing away because of that. The red line there is just around Christmas of 2021, where we started to see the emergence of Omicron. And Omicron was a further variant where there was quite a significant shift in the genetics of the virus. And the impact that that had was it shifted from primarily a lower respiratory tract in those people who got very severe disease to an upper respiratory tract infection, where the vast majority of people who got this disease then had primarily upper airway. So they had the cold-like symptoms as well as the fevers and shivers. But with this variant, we saw less and less pneumonia. So you can see the whopping great numbers of, of cases there. And although there was a peak uh, again in deaths, this was primarily in older people or those people who are on immunosuppressive medication. And once we looked at the numbers of people in hospital with pneumonia, this actually dropped. So although there's a massive rise in the death rates, this was primarily a numbers game because of the massive increase in the number of cases. But where we are now with COVID, is with Omicron and the, the subvariants that we've seen since then, we're seeing less and less significant pneumonias with that. So it's, it's having less of an impact on those people with underlying lung disease. So we're seeing less people coming in with bad pneumonia. So people with COPD, people with asthma, people with pulmonary fibrosis, they do get a little bit sicker, but they don't have the significant hospitalizations that we would have seen with the first few variants. And as I said, uh, what we're seeing primarily now is older people and frail people. So the vast majority of people who come into hospital with COVID will usually be old, they'll be extremely confused and agitated because they get lots of fevers and shivers, uh, or those people, particularly on a lot of the rheumatological drugs where they're getting a lot of immunosuppression. Um, but we're seeing less and less COVID with bad pneumonia. So I think in terms of the workforce, we're seeing less people uh, having to come into hospital so we're seeing people who may be off for the five or so days until they test negative. So I'm sure you've seen this in wherever you work, that there's less and less people actually having severe disease and uh, missing time and work because of that. Okay, I wanna move on then to a few of the specific exposures that I see causing people to get lung disease. And again, the two of the, the major ones uh, would be silica. And even though we have fairly uh, small numbers of significant uh, uh, manufacturing in Northern Ireland, we're still seeing lots of agriculture, lots of other people who are exposed and at risk, and then asbestos exposure. Uh, and uh, what I want to do then is just show the importance of, of minimizing exposure, because very often people don't actually have, have any disease 
until uh, further down the line. So I want to sort of highlight the importance of good hygiene and trying to prevent any exposures. So the easiest way to, to illustrate these things are with cases. So this is the first case. It's a 30 year old gent who was admitted to hospital with a fall from a ladder. And he was referred to me because he had quite an abnormal chest X-ray and a normal abnormal CT scan. So obviously, if we look at what normal looks like first, so this is an X-ray. This is if the person standing in front of you and the nice white blob in the middle of your heart, you can see the lungs either side. And because the air in an X-ray is black, the black bits underneath the ribs there are obviously the lungs. So we can see this gent uh, presented following a fall and he cracked his chest. And incidentally, the ED team found all these little dots that you can see throughout both lung fields. So these are lots of areas of calcification, lots of little nodules throughout both lungs. And then when you uh, look at on a CT scan, this is what a normal CT scan is like. And then his CT scan, you can see this is markedly abnormal. So you can see lots of small little areas of nodules and calcification throughout both lung fields the whole way down. So really this guy was a self-employed stonemason. Um, so he was working from when he left school at around um, 15 or 16. And he was highly skilled, uh, had a, an excellent business. But for the first 15 years, he didn't have any form of respiratory protection or uh, any personal protection whatsoever. He would have been cutting different stones to make uh, lintels for doors and also more decorative stonework. But really, at the time of his presentation, he had absolutely no symptoms. And it was only because he fell off a ladder that it became to light that he had underlying lung disease. And because he was self-employed, he had no occupational health input. So clearly, he was not going to have any spirometry or screening x-rays or anything like that. But not surprisingly, when you see his chest x-ray, he also had markedly abnormal breathing tests. So because of his work as a stonemason, he had quite marked exposure to respirable, respirable silica. And very often we'll see what we would class as the traditional occupation. So those people who cut stone, be that the masons themselves or miners, people who might melt uh, glass or metal and so get exposed to silica. So the likes of workers, there's a large case of sandblasters in Turkey whenever stonewashed jeans were a, a fashion. Uh, large numbers of people in sweatshops sandblasting jeans came down with quite marked silica and silicosis. But we're also seeing more novel occupations, things that are starting to come to light. So there's kitchen worktops. So this thing called soapstone. Uh, so there's lots of, uh, and this is a very silica rich uh, uh, stone, which is used for kitchen worktops. And very often this is done in small scale uh, workshops. But again, it's trying to look out for these things so that we know that we have to try and focus these people in terms of making them aware that they must have good hygiene in terms of wearing protective equipment, but also particularly if they're in larger industries, targeting these people for uh, screening. So silica exposure is one of the areas where we have to think strongly about uh, screening. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay. Now, uh, We'll just move on again to another area. So obviously uh, there's a large shipbuilding legacy within Belfast here. We can look across from the building where we are out across Belfast Lock round to the docks. So this was a very large employer for a long time within Belfast. Um, uh, clearly part of the ship manufacture for a long time was asbestos exposure. So very often the asbestos was used for lagging uh, pipes in terms of the plumbing, but also it wouldn't just be the, the white men that we traditionally would have uh, thought about or heard about in the shipyards. Also people who work a lot in pipes would be they plumbers, electricians. So there's lots of people who, have, who would be exposed to significant amount of asbestos, very often not realizing it. And this can often have lots of knock on consequences. So very often we've seen lots of the, what we classify as a non-malignant disease, but these can also be uh, impact uh, in quality of life and life threatening. And then we think about the, the malignancy. So there's a marked increase and in additive effect of asbestos exposure with smoking. So you get this markedly increased risk of primary lung cancer. And then we think about mesothelioma, which is the cancer of the lining of the lung itself. So again, if we look at our, our normal chest x-ray again, so if you can see in this x-ray, you've got lots of areas and shadowing over the lungs and very often these are described as having a maple leaf, leaf appearance. And what these are, are thickening and calcification of the lining of the lung. 
And this is, these are things called pleural plaques. So essentially, once you uh, inhale small particles of asbestos, the lung tries to get rid of these by transporting it out to the edge of the lung. And once this happens, you get some inflammation and irritation of the lining of the lung, which then can become thickened and hardened. And over time, this then becomes calcified. So you can see areas over to the right as you're looking at it, where the density of these uh, plaques are almost the same as the bones. So this is where you get calcification of these. So these are uh, non-malignant. They don't impact hugely in terms of the lung function. And really what they are, are a marker of your asbestos exposure. It's almost like a tattoo on the lining of the lung to say that you've been exposed somewhere. And again, very often, the more you're exposed, the more significant the plaques are. And this was a man who's actually in the Matter Hospital last week. And because of uh, uh, the exposure to asbestos, pleuroplex in Northern Ireland are potentially eligible for compensation. Um, and because this is devolved within the UK, I think in Scotland and Northern Ireland, plaques are eligible for compensation, but they're not within England and Wales. Um, so part of the role that I have is it letting people know that if they have evidence of pleural plaques, they are potentially eligible for compensation. Um, and as I say, it's a marker that you've been exposed to asbestos. And if we look at this, this is a CT scan. So this is as if you've been cut through the middle and we're looking up from underneath. If you look over to the left of your screen, you can see that area just sitting below a rib. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer here that comes out. But if you look at about 10 and 11 o'clock there on, on the screen, you can see the area that's just sitting underneath the rib where it's hardened and calcified. And then the next scan is with the lungs within it. So they just sit there, they don't cause a huge amount of problem. The difficulty that we have is that mesothelioma is a significant issue. And this is where you get the primary malignancy of the lining of the lung. And this is always, nearly always associated with asbestos exposure. But the difficulty is there's no significant relationship between the amount of uh, asbestos that you're exposed to and you developing the disease. Now, like most of the diseases with asbestos exposure, there is a lag, and that's usually around 30 years. Um, but sometimes because of the, the development of the mesothelioma, there might be a bit of a lag, less of a lag. But the symptoms that people usually present with are breathlessness or pain. And very often the pain is quite nonspecific and could be down to lots of other things. And people don't think that this could be mesothelioma. And very often you don't actually see plaques in the chest x-ray. So it's something that we need to think about if somebody can complains of a long history of pain without uh, any clear cause. And part of this then we can see is a chest x-ray here. And you can see the plaques there on the right hand side. But on the left, you can see a lot more shadowing. And this is fluid that's sitting outside the lung. So this is a thing called pleural effusion. And from my point of view, if I see fluid outside the lung, a thing called pleural effusion, this makes me very suspicious of mesothelioma. So somebody's clearly got asbestos exposure. They're presenting with uh, plaques. And they also have this new fluid. This is something that I'd be very concerned about. Now, um, this is a, an interesting thing. This is a thing called a PET scan. And the PET scan is a type of scan that we've been using for helping and diagnose cancer. So imagine if you just get a, an injection of radioactive glucose. And if you imagine hungry cells are very active, so they use the glucose very quickly and they light up. So you can see the brain at the top. You can see the kidneys halfway down in the bladder, but you can also see here as we're standing, uh, as the person as if they're standing in front of you looking at them, you can see the whole right lung there. It's as if they're standing in front of you, so what's on the left is actually their right. So you can see that whole right lung is lighting up. And essentially, this is the, the mesothelioma. So you're getting a cancer of the lining of the lung, which over time causes this thickening. And basically what happens is not only do you get pain once that starts to go into ribs, but it, it causes the lung to shrink down. And again, this is a PET scan combined with a CT scan. So if you imagine you're sliced up the middle, but you've also got the overlapping PET scan, which shows things that are active. So clearly you can see two things here. You can see the, the lining of the lung is very, very active uh, and lighting up very quickly. But also if you look and compare the right side, which is the, the, the nice active bit to the other side, you can see the lungs essentially getting smaller. So essentially as the lining of the lung increases because of the cancer, it makes you breathless and causes a lot of volume loss. And unfortunately with mesothelioma, uh, 
it's it's associated with a relatively grim survival, and there's nothing once you are diagnosed with mesothelioma. There's there's no despite treatment, you know, the average survival is in the, in the realms of one year, and we're seeing numbers increase over time. Unfortunately, we've only got the cancer registry data available up to 2017 as they're going to rise, and because of the increased use of asbestos over the years, we think this is probably going to peak in about 2030. So even despite the advances in, in current treatment options for cancers, the chemotherapy, which has been shown to improve survival, but that's only a modest survival by about three months. So again, uh, with mesothelioma, it's important that we counsel people. They are eligible for industrial and disablement benefit and also compensation. Right, so I think that's my time more or less. Uh, and really what I wanted to do was just to highlight where we are in Northern Ireland, but also the importance of exposures and the risks and the diseases that we commonly see because of exposures to particular problems within the workplace and minimizing those exposures can minimize the long-term side effects. And also, despite being a relatively small region, we are still seeing lots of asbestos-related disease. And even though we're not seeing huge amounts of manufacturing, we still see lots of silica and silica exposure out there. And I think there's lots of things that are out there that we're just not discovering. OK, so I think that's me and my time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was fantastic. Really comprehensive and super speedy. Whistle slap through. But really important there to highlight the, the importance that um, public health can have the impact on workers' health and vice versa. And um, there's certainly lots of lessons still to be learned from the, the COVID pandemic and how these underlying health issues that, that can either be caused by work or otherwise can still have detrimental effects when there, you know, a respiratory uh, infection comes along. So uh, thank you. And now it's time we're going to move on to uh, our next speaker, who is Mike Calcutt. So he's no stranger to BOHS in recent years. Um, many of you will remember Mike from the conferences and also the fact that he had the pleasure of being my boss for a few years as well when I worked at HSE. And he is now uh, head of health and work branch at HSE. So here we are. Hand over to Mike. Thank you, Marianne, and uh, afternoon, everyone. So the question we've been asked is, uh, what more should we be doing to support workers' health? And I think that's a really crucial question at the moment, uh, and I'm really, really glad that Marion and Carl have asked that question. Uh, I'm glad they've asked it of me. I'm glad they're asking it of you. Um, and I think it's, it's really important that BOHS recognize they've got a key contribution to make and um, i think it requires us all to pay attention to pay attention to what we can do but also to try and work out what we will do what we will actually do and what we won't actually do um, so just a bit about me i joined hsc when regulations first came into the uk by way of eu directives and when briefly we had to give duty holders two weeks notice that we were going to serve them an improvement notice. Um, and that was when nearly everybody pleaded guilty in health and safety prosecutions, but hardly any of them were about health. Since then, I've spent time leading teams of inspectors. And uh, as Marion mentioned, not least some excellent occupational hygienists uh, in delivering operations. And lately, I'm heading up um, development of HSC's regulatory strategy and policy for reducing work-related work ill health. So I feel really privileged to join you in Northern Ireland today um, because I feel like a bit of an imposter in this room, but uh, I guess I'm the sort of the, the, uh, the wider view of, of the problem that, uh, that Paul's presented. So I think the key is thinking about why we all do what we do, um, because thinking about why helps you better understand how. Um, how can we best support workers' health? It's not easy working this out. There are lots of things we could do, um, and they would all contribute to such a broad objective. But it's really, for me as a regulator, it's about working out which interventions, which activities are the best fit for making the biggest difference, uh, and which what can we do with the resources that are available. 
and therefore, what can't we do? Uh, overall, I think a focus on prevention is the key. Uh, it's absolutely critical. And to get that focus on prevention, what we need is the support to put that into practice from service providers. And all that adds up to, hopefully, a compelling case for those who are responsible for the risk and responsible for making sure that the precautions are in place. I don't feel I need to dwell on why with this uh, this group of people today, because um, because the fact that you've joined this call means that you get it. Um, really, that you know, the stats show us that work-related ill health is a much bigger issue in terms of incidents and economics and personal impact um, than are the issues from safety-related accidents. And there's no forecast that the ill health <coughs> statistics are going to reduce unless somebody does something more. So I'm sure you'll all recognise there are significant levels of work-related ill health. Uh, HSE often quotes estimations of 12,000 lung disease deaths each year and 1.8 million workers suffering from work-related ill health. The rate of total self-reported work-related illness was higher in 22-23 than it was in 2018-2019. Uh, before coronavirus, uh, and that's largely driven by a higher rate of um, self-reported self work-related stress, depression or anxiety, and that's running at around about 2,600 cases per 100,000 workers. It's difficult to know what that exactly that means. I'm assuming it means an actual increase in stress and depression and anxiety, but also uh, increased recognition of what was there before. But let's not forget that there are estimated 38,000 workers in Great Britain suffering from a work-related breathing or lung problem in 22-23. The current rate of self-reported musculoskeletal disorders is running at steady, uh, running at around 1,400 cases per 100,000 workers. Um, Paul says silicosis cases have reduced over time, um, but sadly. Uh, probably some sufferers of silicosis died uh, prematurely during the COVID crisis. But why all this means a lot to me takes me back to when I was a principal inspector in the northwest of England, uh, when a concerned inspector one day uh, came and told me that there was a quite an agitated man trying to get into the building and they were a bit worried about letting him in. And I'll always feel quite ashamed that um, I supported that inspector um, and was a bit overcautious about letting the man in because um, this is that man and his name's Terry. Um, Terry was employed as a stone worker in a prestigious private school in Lancashire um, and he used to have a keen interest in sports uh, and outdoor pursuits including karate and he was he had a really active family life. Um, Terry was upset because he couldn't breathe properly um, and he could no longer enjoy his holidays, couldn't enjoy his swimming, couldn't do his work properly, uh, and his active family life was being curtailed by his illness. Um, he couldn't run, and if he walked too far, he got breathless. He was diagnosed with silicosis, and in this video, Terry tells uh, duty holders to make sure they protect the staff, and he tells other stone workers to demand the right protections from their employers. Terry also says in the video that what contributed most to him suffering from silicosis was pressure of work. Uh, there were three stone workers in a small enclosure for years providing sandstone for a major development on the site. I'd been telling his employer for years that there was a problem with dust at work. Uh, and even after the college was notified of a, a diagnosis of silicosis, they still failed to take any action and they didn't do any monitoring of the dust levels. Um, we prosecuted and I'm pleased to say the school was fined £100,000, but that was too late for Terry. He already had irreversible silicosis and his life was ruined as far as he was concerned. The basis for the Health and Safety at Work Act and my role as a regulator is prevention. So to prevent disease, we need to reduce workers' exposure to health risks to a low enough level. If Terry's employer had asked you to sort out some air monitoring for silica, 
How do you think you would have handled that commission? I hope, if you're on this call, you would have said that there's an obvious dust problem here. Um, firstly, all you've got to do is put in the recommended controls. Having done that, I could probably uh, rec carry out some uh, monitoring for you, some exposure measurements, and they will validate whether the, those controls that you put in place are working, and then we can keep an eye on whether they're working over time. Being responsible for HC strategy for reducing ill health has led me to conclude that there are four key elements to look at now. Uh, and we need to, re and together, these will reduce the exposure of workers to health risks. I don't think compliance, simple compliance with, with what's currently expected will deliver us a significant enough reduction. So I think the most important element of supporting workers is to establish new or more efficient control measures. New means taking advantage of technological developments and challenging the people with the know-how to come up with better controls for protecting workers. This might mean going beyond what's already there, um, and it might mean collaborating with other companies and collaborating with other disciplines within your industry, but it's all about designing out risk or coming up with the best possible solution for the future. This won't be a new concept for most companies. I'm sure that they already collaborate on product development. I'm sure that they already uh, collaborate on for quality, improving quality. And they might even do it for safety reasons, but I don't think they do it enough for health reasons. Um, if you're gonna try and come up with better controls, the most important thing is to validate the performance of the new control solution for both its effectiveness to reduce ill health and its overall efficiency as a control. Because um, what that does then is help drive its sustainability, whether people want to keep using it. Uh, and that's not done enough yet for health risks. So, it all means taking measures that may not have been considered reasonably practical in the past and recognising that we can raise our expectations for the future. Now, by more, emission, more efficient control measures, I mean control measures that are more effective at controlling risk, that may even be cheaper to implement in the long run, or at least provide a good return on investment, because they work better and they're easier for people to operate. If you think about local exhaust ventilation, it will always be needed because it's really important, it's really necessary to protect workers. But you have to admit it's an expensive and not the easiest control measure to operate. It's quite difficult, it's quite expensive to install it properly. Uh, you have to look after it, you have to maintain it. And uh, it requires management time to make sure your workers operate their LED properly. Often substitution and elimination can appear more expensive to duty holders and more expensive to advisors and more difficult to do. But actually, if you take a longer term view, substitution and, elim and elimination could look much more sustainable over the longer term for a cost conscious employer. And um, driving compliance is what most people think regulators do, but I'd highlight the word sustainable because um, sustainable compliance is slightly different. Compliance just means you're doing as you're told. Sustainable compliance means you're doing as you're told and you're making sure you carry on doing as you're told by uh, making sure you've got supervision, training, monitoring and review. And I think review is absolutely the key here. Um, I think a lot of companies struggle with review, but it's just as important, if not more important than, than the other elements. Because if you don't review and if you don't validate the controls, you'll never know how effective it's being and you'll never know whether you could make it better. Companies who do do that review and validate generally will rely on external um, service providers to validate those controls. And they'll see that as an additional cost and most likely they will not want to carry it out as often as they should. But validating workplace health risk 
management measures depends on a committed professional. You need the right discipline with the right outlook. Not just any generalist health and safety um, consultant can do this. You need, you need to have the right person with the right competency and the right skills to give you the right answer. At HSE, we train our inspectors to dig deeper into exposure controls and, and how those controls are managed. But we've also got our specialist inspectors um, who we call on, who've got more insight, more understanding, and can interpret when, when needed. Now, if the key strategies are establishing new and more efficient controls to reduce exposure and driving sustainable control, then the support needed to put that into practice provided by occupational health services and occupational hygienists is absolutely critical. Poor service provision focusing on short-term objectives and narrow advice won't achieve sustainable compliance and it won't achieve sustainable control. It won't identify new or more efficient controls. If occupational health providers and occupational hygienists can work together to advise duty holders in a way that supports more forward thinking leadership of health and safety, then more enlightened, more effective, ultimately more efficient compliance uh, can become embedded. All of this needs to be built on evidence though. It's no good just saying it, you've got to build it on evidence. Um, so another thing we can do to support workers' health is to work together from our different disciplines to build the evidence base to support benchmarks to support problem solving and hopefully to help duty holders be more confident about taking on the new controls. So let me outline some ways that we can establish new controls, we can drive sustainable compliance and we can ensure um, effective support services. As I said, building the evidence base is absolutely critical and that's about discovering what we don't know, analysing what we think we know and validating understanding to prove concepts and to prove that things work. If we do that, then we can use that to set some rules. Um, setting rules can be through the regulations, approved codes of practice, but also industry standards. Um, and getting those widely recognised is the key. Once the standards are clear, then you can educate people about them, you can promote them, you can make incentives that, that drive people to implement those standards. Uh, Breathe Freely campaign, BOHS's Breathe Freely campaign, has been really, really successful. And aids like the welding selector tool and ventilation tool, not least which Marion had a hand in, um, produced during the COVID pandemic, have been incredibly successful at raising awareness of what people should do. Sometimes, especially when expectations are well embedded, we can establish industry-based schemes that help people implement what's required. Um, so we would use intermediaries like fit to fit uh, being a prime example. Some people are influenced by fear of enforcement or catastrophic incidents, um, which can be achieved through publicising penalties and publicising when it's gone wrong. But that's not as influential as everybody thinks it is, because a lot of people aren't influenced by it. Um, but when it works, we do it. Um, Direct contact, the last box in the list, is, is my job. Um, that's investigating and inspecting, which is highly effective at, at getting control, but the resource is scant, and we've got to be really careful about how we target that resource. So we need all of the other measures, all the other approaches um, in combination with, with regulating. So ideally, we can find a compelling case that convinces those responsible to take the right action. Which leads me to mention some underlying and underpinning considerations that I think we should be alert to today. Um, establishing benchmark standards does depend on applying science, applying science and technical expertise to develop our understanding of existing and emerging health risks and the protective measures necessary. By analysing findings from research and data, evidence will be provided to discover and validate information about risks and required controls. And we can use this to explain the benefits that happen. Now, impact on health risk can then be measured by evaluating 
effect and the reduction in exposure rather than waiting for the change in disease. If exposure is a leading indicator of risk, we know we can measure the success of controls and the success of campaigns. And so to do that, I'm convinced that expanding the use of biological monitoring is key to this as it offers a faster and more economical method of establishing exposure. And um, fortunately, I've got a colleague called Kate Jones, who I'm absolutely in awe of, and she can tell me how much substances people have been exposed to from the urine, the blood, the saliva, and even the sweat. Um, and people got more used to providing samples during the pandemic. And as it's lunchtime, I'm gonna leave that there because I frankly don't want to know how Kate does that. I know enough about it, thank you. I'm glad she can do it. And I don't, I don't need to know the details of how she does it. But we know we can make this work as both an indicator and as an influencing tool from a project we ran a few years ago to drive up standards for spraying vehicles with isocyanate paint. We proved it worked using biological monitoring to show the change in exposure and match it to the change in behaviour. I'm also hoping we'll have a funded PhD um, opportunity to use biological monitoring to understand more about exposure to welding fumes and its effects on different organs in the body. Um, as you will know, uh, conducting personal sampling on arc welders can be difficult, um, especially if they're wearing air fed. Uh, welding helmets. So searching for a simpler way to determine how much individuals have been exposed to welding fume um, will allow employers to take better action and, and validate the controls they've got in place. Um, so when we've got that PhD uh, sorted, I'll ask Jackie Morton from HC to share more with, with BOHS members about um, how that's going to go ahead. Um, I know BOHS has been campaigning about the risk of asbestos exposure um, after commercial buildings change hands, and there's an ongoing discussion about that. And the focus is quite rightly on large buildings and, and commercial, but let's not forget the domestic sector as well, because with net zero, what we've got is potentially armies of, of younger, less experienced construction workers going out doing uh, refurbishment and retrofitting on, on housing stock. And we've potentially got a huge problem with people who don't even know they've got asbestos in the house. Uh, and we've got less experienced um, construction workers visiting those premises to, uh, to, to potentially disturb the asbestos. So I think we need to keep an eye on that as well. Corporate social responsibility, uh, a lot of companies are quite, quite bold about um, this sort of form of self-regulation and, and they talk about their, their economic responsibilities and their philanthropic responsibilities and their ethical and, and environment, especially their environmental responsibilities. But I'm sometimes surprised how quiet they are on their responsibilities to their workers. They don't talk about that in the same kind of, with the same kind of passion. You don't hear it. That, that we're looking after our workforce as well. There's bits coming through on well-being now, but well-being is generally about treating problems after they've happened. And what we really want to be doing is focusing on prevention. And I think companies need to do a bit more uh, to recognise their corporate social responsibility to look after their workers. So by way of an example, um, some of you will recognise this as a uh, electroplating bath, um, this, in this case nickel, uh, and you'll know that if you electroplate with nickel compounds, you can uh, you will expose people to asthmogens, carcinogens, skin sensitizers. Exposure occurs by inhalation, absorption, and through the skin and by ingestion. Um, this rig is at the HSC Science Division at South Buxton Laboratory. And we did some tests there, um, led by Matt Caldwell, John Saunders, um, Steve Bennett and Paul Smith, some of whom are BOHS, BOHS members. Um, and we want to show the effectiveness of some new controls. So um, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that bubbling air through the tanks keeps the chemicals mixed, which means you get the right quality of electroplating. But that means the chemicals are cooled. Uh, increasing the energy cost to heat the tanks. And it also means that the, uh, the bubbles drive the chemicals into the atmosphere. So you need the a, a LEV around the top of the tank 
which wastes the chemicals by um, just throwing them out the back door. LEV is really effective at capturing and protecting the worker, um, but if it stops, the worker just carries on because it doesn't make any difference whether it's working or not to the worker. Um, and you've got to look after the LED. It's got to be properly installed, maintained and supervised. So the lab work showed that ringed in red on the, on the photograph on the right, and uh, uh, some yellow devices called deductors. I don't know why they're called deductors, but that's what they're called. Um, and what they do is they stir the chemical without bubbling air through it. And in that way, what you, you don't cool the chemicals, you don't get the bubbles, so you get less exposure, less, less emissions of chemicals. Um, so they eliminate the, the emissions at source. If the inductors stop working, the worker stops working because the quality drops considerably. So it effectively fails to safety rather than fails to danger, like with the LEV stopping working. So if you use inductors, effectively you can eliminate the exposure. And that makes inductors reasonably practicable, where previously we would have said LEV was reasonably practical. So it's been so successful, we, we produced a research report in August 22, and it's been disseminated through a number of presentations. And um, the Trade Association, the Surface Engineering Association, have adopted this, um, and uh, they are going to update um, some industry guidance early in 24, and they've also tech engaged their own experts to take this work forward. So I think that's just a really, really good example of how, of how it's sort of how you can take a practical benefit to the duty holder, to, to the company, and do more to protect workers. So industry spends, in terms of supporting um, sports services, industry spends over a billion pounds a year. Um, and some of the services they get are really good, and some of the services they get are not the most forward thinking in the world. Um, there are a few legal requirements around for health surveillance, which will support early identification of, of problems, uh, and it's an important check and balance, but there are also requirements, and there are requirements that people are fit to work. We can enforce those, but what we really want is good services in the first place. Um, catching people who aren't so good isn't really the way forward. We need the industry to step up. We need the industry to give the service to the duty holders that we need. So the industry, uh, the, the service support industry, are key, key change agents for me, and um, it's a big job. And I think there's an enormous role for organisations like the OHS to influence this approach uh, to influence each other, to collaborate with each other, and to come up with kind of a multidisciplinary um, movement. Um, and we're starting to work with, with uh, certainly SOM at the moment, and um, Paul mentioned the government push at the moment um, to improve service provision, especially occupational health. So I'm really pleased that uh, BOHS is a is a prime mover in this area and has also set a precedent for other professional bodies by producing the buyer's guide and the good practice guide for consultants. Um, and I think that's absolutely essential and it's a huge step forward um, because it gives us a real chance for duty holders to get the services they need and it, and it really sets a standard for, for the industry to, uh, to give a consistent support to, to the duty holders. So you'll be Paul mentioned the government push at the moment and I think uh, I need to read this bit because I need to make sure that I say the right thing because uh, it's just come out. So the government response to the consultation which ran recently and um, there were 882 responses were received from the healthcare sector, the public sector, charities, trade unions, insurance companies and businesses. Uh, and the majority of respondents supported developing a national workplace health and disability standard 
and a minimum framework for quality occupational health provision. They highlighted the need for easily accessible, high quality occupational health service provision, and there was a recognition for a need to develop the workforce and a need to develop a multidisciplinary workforce. So the UK government's going to take this forward, and I'm acutely aware I'm in a room full of non-Irish people here. So um, just to reassure you all that I've checked, and the Department of Work and Pensions and the Department of Health and Social Care have promised that they're going to continue to work with devolved administrations. Um, and from my point of view, I'm meeting with HSI, HSC and I uh, tomorrow morning to talk through um, how we're both taking forward this, this commission. Um, and we're beginning to talk with um, key players in Scotland and Wales as well. So it is a, it is a UK wide um, movement that we're, we're working towards here. So there's definitely a need for occupational health services to set clear standards for competent advice and quality service provision. But we also need different disciplines to be involved to understand how important it is that they work together and to play to each other's strengths in a way that really does support what the duty holders need to get the best effect, to get the best controls and to get the most sustainable uh, reduction in risk for the future. So in conclusion, um, we haven't got time to wait around. Uh, and if we don't step up, nobody else is going to do it. Um, so workers are being exposed at the moment. They are becoming ill and that's unnecessary and unacceptable. So I'm admitting to you that I've heard the call, um, not least from Marion and Carl. So um, and an, working with some excellent occupational hygienists in the past, I know that this is possible. All you've got to do is to be really determined and work really hard, think really carefully and make sure you actually do something and you actually listen to each other and talk to each other. And you know what? Together, I think we can do this. And I'll hand back to Marion. Well, thanks very much, Mike, for that. That was brilliant. And um, also thank you for the plug about the buyer's guide for occupational hygiene services. Absolutely think that's essential for everybody out there, you know, who needs to engage in an occupational hygiene um, consultant um, to make sure that you're going to get somebody competent and knows what they're doing as well. And obviously they sign up to a code of ethics as well when they're members of BOHS. So obviously their number one priority will be the, the protection of the workers' health. And absolutely, one thing I think is desperately needed out there is something similar for occupational health provision, including all the other um, work streams and disciplines out there, such as um, physios and also mental health um, providers as well. Uh, we do need to know what what are good ones, uh, and you know what sh what should we be looking for when we need to engage in them as service providers. And as employers, most people do want a one stop shop. You know, you go to one person, have one contract in place, and they're able to then call in the services of the other disciplines that are needed. So there's quite a lot of work to be done out there um, in terms of uh, making sure that people do follow the same suit as BOHS and have um, lay their stall out as to what the expectations are to get a good quality service. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I find it very, very interesting, especially calling for a collaborative approach between um, health and safety, occupational health, occupational hygienists, and especially the need to think outside the box whenever you know, you're saying, yes, LEB uses that's the go-to for it, but then you're finding deductors and other um, possible um, controls are just as, if not more effective. So very interesting there. Thank you. Um, We'll go to questions just as a reminder if you have any uh, questions that you wish to ask either of our speakers um please uh, enter into the chat and um, we have a few in there at the minute um but just to kick us off um i have, I have one for paul um whenever it comes to uh, asbestos 
um, and what you find in, in uh, your clinic. Is it generally just historical or are you seeing what Mike mentioned when it comes to um, less experienced um, sort of workers doing refurbishments and issues like that? Uh, so, obviously with asbestos, usually there's a significant lag between exposure and disease, and people I see will primarily have disease, so it's always, you know, 20 to 30 years after the initial exposure, or they may not have realised they've had any exposure. So I think, you know, we're at sort of two ends of the, the spectrum here, I'm at the one end, you know, of seeing all the effects of the exposure, where from a, a hygiene end of things you're trying to prevent or minimise exposure. But um, I suppose it's highlighting, from my point of view, it's highlighting the fact that even minimal exposures to asbestos can have significant effects down the line. And again, I suppose for those people with less experience in terms of building or not aware of the dangers of asbestos exposure, that's part of that. But I think really, you know, I'm at the end where it's, it's disease or incidental finding rather than the young people. Although we do get some people who will present saying, you know, my garage has asbestos tiles and they're removed. Uh, have any problems here? So it's, it's there's a, a worry mm -hmm. and it's trying to balance the concern of any exposure versus the risk of actually getting something. But um, so it's only the once people develop disease is unfortunately where I see them. Great, thank you. Um, have we got any questions? Um, yeah, the so a question from Adele. Uh, McClellan, can pleural plaques happen with other exposures? Or is it... uh, no, well, in theory they can, but the majority that we will see will either be due to asbestos exposure or tuberculosis. And the difference is usually with TB, it's on one side only, it's higher up in the lung. Um, but once you start seeing them on both sides, it's almost, almost certainly asbestos. It's a quick one. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. Um, just with the mention, <clears throat> sorry, just with the mention of um, the recent consultation, is there a minimum standard that you would like to see from occupational health? Um, not necessarily just within Northern Ireland, but from the In terms of referrals to me, or in terms of monitoring exposure, or in terms of everything? Uh, yeah, everything. Um, so that's a that's a, an hour and a half on its own. Um, I think from my point of view, the use asbestos again as an example, where very minimal exposures can end up with life changing disease. So I think, you know, it's trying to ensure good hygiene, ensure appropriate uh, protective equipment in the people who are working with things. Um, so I suppose that's almost as, as good as anything, because once again, the CD, unfortunately, it's too late for anything like that. In terms of standards, um, we'd love to be able to ensure that everybody who has any poten potential exposure gets a new screening program, if that's appropriate, be that for asthmagens, uh, be that for the likes of silica exposure. And unfortunately, in Northern Ireland, we've got a predominant small enterprise, lots of self-employed people who don't often uh, either uh, see the relevance or can afford occupational health or hygiene. So I think it's trying to maximize awareness mm -hmm. as much as anything else. And um, what we are trying to do is standardize referrals to me from an occupational health board. So people at the occupational health, particularly with asthma, uh, surveillance, asthma screening, once it, it reaches a certain level, it's allowing them to refer to me quickly, be that NHS or, or from the private sector. And the difficulty we have is the lag between the referral coming to me and getting on to my general clinic because of the mercy waiting lists. I know the waiting lists here in the UK are the worst anywhere. So I think it, it's there's lots of areas where things can be improved. From my point of view, there's lots of things that I can do better, but also I think it's it's improving awareness of the exposures, minimizing the exposure, and then from an occupational point of view, them having the ability to refer to me quickly and me being able to see people quickly. Don't does that answer your question? I'm not sure if it does or not. Um, so there aren't any 
take more questions in the chat box. So we'll give you another uh, couple of minutes if you have any questions, uh, let us know. Um, but in the, oh, there's a, a hand up, yes. So is there a question coming in? Oh, yep. Hi, can you hear me? Can, can you yes, hear me? Yes. Oh, hi, it's mm -hmm. Catherine. Um, I've tried to do the chat box, but it's failing to send, so I'm just wondering if people are having an issue with it. But I was just going to, it's a bit of an observation, really, um, a little bit of a question. One of the issues I come across um, a lot is the overdependence of and the improper use of RPE, um, which is particularly concerning when there's respirable crystalline silica available. Um, it's quite frustrating to see large organisations, particularly uh, multinational companies, allowing this to go on year after year. And I'm just wondering if it would be possible to put something in place where uh, if this is found, there's some sanctions that can be taken to get them to uh, move up the hierarchy of control rather than just leaving it to RPE. Yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. Um, do you want to take that one, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> given that one to you a few months ago, wouldn't I? Yeah, I was going to uh, say, in my old previous life, maybe. Yeah. So, um, hi, Catherine. Yeah, it's um, so yes. I mean, clearly there are there there is there is posh, there is the hierarchy, and we should be pushing people um, as high up the hierarchy as we can. I think what's happened is over uh, years and years and years what people have done is sort of settled for what felt achievable. So um, you were better off getting something than nothing. And if you could get everybody to have RPE, um, at least people were being protected. And I think that, you know, we've, we've possibly gone for um, not what we really wanted as, as a society, to, to get something that was pragmatic and, and sort of reasonable. And I think what we need to do now is to bite the bullet and push people up the hierarchy. So what I want to do over, the, I mean, we've got a 10 year strategy in HSE, and I'm gonna to talk to the, um, certainly talk to HSE, HSE and I about what, what their plans are. But I think you know there are there are things that we may have accepted over the last few years that we need to not now accept. Now the only thing is we aren't going to achieve that shift by um, serving a few improvement notices and taking a few prosecutions to to achieve that shift and and raise everybody's expectations for effectively compliance, but in BOHS terms, sustainable control. What we're going to have to do is use all of those levers that I mentioned, all of the education and all of the set standards and using the intermediaries and the professional bodies. So that's why I think it's a it's a real combined effort over the next few years to get everybody to say, do you know what? More than PPE is achievable. And if and if we all commit to, to that expectation, then we can get the duty holders to, to do it. But I think it's going to have to be a sustained combined effort. I don't think any one bit of the UK health and safety system can just simply make that happen overnight. And I and I know people yeah, think the regulator. I think it's worth I don't even think the regulator would do it. I think it's worth considering um the impact of the announcement in 2019, I think it was, when um something uh, was was came out about welding fumes because there, there did seem to be quite a, a, a big and fast response to that um, across industry uh, with people, um, with organisations coming forward for advice, with a lot more um, companies um, making changes to LEV or RPE. Um, so it, I, I think, you know, something like that, some kind of you know, maybe assessing why that was taken so seriously when other things haven't been, um, because there was there is as much information about uh, respirable crystalline silica as, as there is about welding fume. Yet that um, bulletin that came out in two thousand and nineteen seemed to just facilitate such a a, a good response um, and and quite proactive and positive. Um, 
Mm. So one of my personal view on that, which is because it said it was carcinogenic and, and therefore everybody sat up because all of a sudden it was carcinogenic. And you think, well, the shift in, in risk wasn't wasn't as big as everybody thinks it is simply by attaching that label to it. It's it's serious, but but in you know if you understand the profile of the risk, it it it'd been pretty risky before. So uh, you know the the difference in response was was bigger than the difference in risk almost. Um, so I think you know effectively what we did was we caught up with where we should have been by by. So following that change in categorization. But I think you're right. It's what we need to do is, is grab the attention, find a way to grab attention. And that's where I think, uh, you know, getting more into biological monitoring and, and things like that, it might, might, that's ways that, that gives us a route to explain to people what the difference is that can be achieved and what they're being exposed to and shows them. And we, we did that with isocyanates. It worked really well. So I think we're looking for something like that to take each of the, the sort of the priority topics and, as you say, put a rocket under them like we did with Weldon Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and yes, just on that point about biological monitoring, obviously that's something I was and still am very keen on developing, especially um, some sort of biological monitoring for welders. Um, but also I know uh, at HSE in the Buxton Laboratories, they're doing excellent work on exposures to silica as well, and looking at um, exhaled breath for silica. So if you're, you're able to demonstrate to those people that opt only for the, the respirator and they don't consider the water suppression or anything else when they're um, using or, or sorry exposed to silica dust um, it would be a good indicator for them to you know do the biological monitoring and say yes you, you have worn your respirator but you've still been exposed to, to some level of silica and the same for welders if they're often only for you know the integrated welding visor with respirator in there um, chances are they're also still exposed to welding fume at, at different times when they're, they're lifting their visor or they're taking their visor off all of those things if they don't engineer out the the controls this rp is the the last line of defense as we know so giving people the tools to actually check themselves as to whether um they're still exposed or not is, is a, a really really uh, important thing i think in educating and making people aware and ultimately it'll lead to compliance of doing more for people to make sure that they are um their their exposure is uh, minimized and there isn't such a heavy reliance on respirators. Thanks. So we haven't had any other questions, have we? No. So um, I think then uh, we will wind up for today. We give ourselves extra time for the questions, but there might well be a problem with the chat box. So I'll, I'll move over and let Kathleen join us now again. Um, but we wanted to, one thing that I think we need to do more of uh, ourselves is actually do more in supporting occupational hygienists, new new occupational hygienists who want to come through the system like Cattle and become competent and get their certificate of competency and then even go on to do um, their diploma and then become a chartered hygienist. So the plan for here is because in Northern Ireland we do have only a handful of people. Um, we want to make sure that we can get as many as them through the certificate, uh, support people through who are wanting to do their certificate to, to um, work their way through it. So our next um, plan is to have an in-person meeting in February. Uh, we will have it, uh, our friends at Queen's University have said we can use their facilities there. We're going to have an in-person one and we're going to have a visit from the president-elect Parm. And we're going to be focusing on how we prepare people to sit the certificate and sit their diploma. So urging anybody that's interested in finding out more about it, how they work their way through the qualifications um, and how they, you know, you would juggle them and with your current job and your roles and expectations um, to actually become, you know, a fully fledged occupational hygienist. So that's the plan. And um, over to Kathleen. Yeah, so um, thank you all for coming. and. 
hopefully we will see a few of you on the 6th of February mm -hmm. um, for our meeting with Pam Farm and um, hopefully going through the uh, way to qualify for first of all your certificate of operational competence and then possibly the diploma. So thank you. Okay. So thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, so we'll say cheerio and hopefully we'll see some friendly faces uh, at our next regional meeting in February then. All right, take care. Bye.